Blog Talk Radio. Welcome one and all. This is your host, Robert Rogers, the founder of the amazing Parkinson's Recovery in 2004. On this radio show series, I interview various individuals who have some amazing and I might say unbelievable suggestions for what individuals who currently experience Parkinson's symptoms can do in order to see a relief of those symptoms and for some cases for individuals to actually see a complete reversal of their symptoms. We interview individuals who currently experience Parkinson's symptoms and hear their stories and we also invite guests who are practitioners of one type or another. So individuals who come from the medical community and the exercise community and the psychological community. And we've got an amazing guest today for you who's got, I must say, what I see to be one of the most creative ways to enhance brain power that I have really ever encountered. A lot of people who experience Parkinson's symptoms have the initial idea, well, what I need to do in order to be able to improve my situation is to find a supplement or a medication that can suppress the symptoms I'm experiencing. So that kind of deadens the problem, so to speak, temporarily. And, of course, uh, people have to continue to ingest those supplements or medications for the rest of their life. But there are other options. There are other alternatives. Today, you're going to hear some suggestions that are anything but gulping down medicines or supplements uh, in order to be able to see some kind of relief. My guest today is the amazing Michael Day J. Lavery, who is the author of Whole Brain Power. How about that for an amazing title? Michael, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time out today for being a guest on the radio show. Robert, I'm honored to be here. I'm so excited about your work, and I must applaud all your efforts, and I am so grateful for this opportunity to be able to share information to people all around the world about how to possibly mitigate some of the rapid decline that people are experiencing, or as you say, to have a reversal of some of the symptoms. Michael, I've been on this journey all, for many years. Tell us all about yourself. Oh, thank you for asking about my biographical information. My name is pronounced Michael J. Lavery. I was born in Arlington, Massachusetts in 1959, and I came from a beautiful family of five children. And My father and my mother spent tremendous amounts of time with us. We had a wonderful childhood. And I was the oldest of four boys, so there were six children, uh, actually five children born in, within six years, so that's the good Catholic family from the Massachusetts area. And... I had a background of going to a Catholic school where they stressed music and art, and I had a father that used to be a professional athlete. He was a coach. He was a history teacher in high school. So I was in an environment that fostered wonderful education and wonderful athletics along with the music and the art. So I feel very blessed to have had this experience as a young man, and I've carried it into my adulthood to this present day. So I had an interesting or a very tragic accident when I was 15. I was in a football game, and I compound fractured my left femur above the knee approximately five inches. It's a very traumatic experience. I was hospitalized for three months. They had to do four operations on my leg, over a year period, and I had a titanium plate put in my leg. It looked as though my sports career was ended at the age of 15, but miraculously, I had a doctor set my leg after the initial injury, and I went back to being a four-star athlete, four-star athlete in college, and I signed a professional baseball contract out of Amherst College, in Massachusetts, and I played in the minor leagues for the Toronto Blue Jays back in the early 1980s. 
So interestingly enough, the injury was a blessing in disguise. It changed my life completely. It opened up my right brain. Actually, it opened up my whole brain. That's why my book's called Whole Brain Power. So little did I realize that that injury would force me to rewire my brain. So when I was laid up in traction for almost 90 days and then had to wear a cast for another two months, and then they, had, they told me I had to have my leg rebroken, I was distraught. Here's a 15-year-old kid that's doing extremely well in sports, and now, now I'm crippled. But out of the ashes comes Phoenix rising. So that's what happened to me metaphorically. So during the process of rehabilitating, I started practicing guitar. So I awakened my right brain by using my left hand. When I went back to playing baseball as a shortstop, my skills in my left hand were much improved. My eye at hitting the baseball were much improved. My eyesight, my tracking of the ball. So I did something to my brain by changing my habits of not playing sports for almost a year and a half to practicing doing painting and memorizing lyrics to songs. So I stimulated my whole brain on both hemispheres in a particular manner that I now promote to my clients. So when you think about it, your right hemisphere controls your left hand and your left hemisphere controls your right hand. So what I did is I moved gradually into an ambidextrous state. That's why it's called whole brain power. So to this day, I practice ambidexterity across the board. I practice riding with both hands. I practice, believe it or not, bouncing golf balls off of a series of hammers. That's why my nickname is The Hammer Man. So you can look me up on the internet, The Hammer Man of Golf. The record that I set back in 2005 of staying focused was bouncing a golf ball off a standard claw hammer in the amount of 7,148 consecutive bounces. I know that sounds as though I have too much time on my hands, but let me tell you what actually happened in the process of starting out with this quest to improve my hand-eye coordination bilaterally. When I was playing baseball, I realized that certain things in my life had to be put on hold. My art and my music were on hold. So I decided to no longer pursue a career in professional baseball. So instead, what I did was I became an entrepreneur in terms of working for myself and being an artist. I studied art at Amherst College, graduated with a fine art degree, and I elected to follow my passion, to be an artist, to be a musician, to be a writer, to be an innovator, to have a sense of humor. So I became a Renaissance man in my own mind. In the process of studying art history, I read about the Renaissance men, Leonardo's and the Michelangelo's, Raphael's, the great thinkers of the early stages of our country, Thomas Jefferson, who was many things to many people, an architect, a phenomenal draftsman, tremendous handwriting. He was the consummate conversationalist. He was a wordsmith. So this is what I decided to do with my life at a very early stage. And that all comes back to this injury that I had when I was 15. Had I never broken that femur, I wouldn't be on this radio show with you today. Life gives us lemons, we make lemonade. So what I've done in my own journey is I've elected to rewire my entire brain. And let me explain. Our brain is comprised of approximately 1 trillion cells. They guesstimate we have 100 billion neurons in the three-pound brain. So consider your brain to be similar to two fists that are butted up against each other. So if you make your fingers and your thumb go into a fist and you butt up the knuckles and the thumb together, 
look down upon your brain in the same manner. You are the captain of your ship. So what we do in this process is we now tell the brain that we're the captain of it and we're grabbing the helm and the brain is going to obey our will. But in many people's lives, the brain's not obeying their will because they're losing their memory. They're getting depressed. They're anxiety prone. They're suffering from dementia, Alzheimer's. They're suffering from Parkinson's disease. Interestingly, interestingly enough, excuse my excitement here, I was in the process of rewiring my brain to become an ambidextrously coordinated tennis player in my 20s. I got to a level where people said, you're not going to get any better. That's it. You, you, you have adequate skills with your left hand at hitting a left-hand forehand because I'm a natural right-hand player. This fits your backhand. Tennis is meant to be played with a forehand and a backhand. So I started doing some research and found out there were ambidextrous tennis players in the past. So I reasoned if they could do it, then I could too. One day the light bulb went off in my head. If I learn how to write with my left hand and do it in a mirror image fashion the way Da Vinci did it, then this would rewire my brain. And sure enough, it worked. People that were mocking me at my ability at hitting a winner, a fluent left-handed forehand with cups on it with accuracy, doubted that I could do it. And then one day the light bulb went off in my brain and the left-handed mirror image writing stimulated the very deep part of my brain called the basal ganglia. Now, I had never heard of that term before until I met a person that was in residency at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. This gentleman heard about my ambidextrous quest, and he said to my sister-in-law that, quote, it's impossible for a man in his 20s, nearing his 30s, to rewire the brain to prove to anyone that there's fluency, there's fluidity with a non-dominant side of the brain and a non-dominant hand to actually convince me that that person's competitive to play at close to professional level. So this gentleman, I'm not going to mention who he is, is very successful in his career as a neurosurgeon and also a researcher in the mechanics of the mammalian brain. He said that there was no possibility of my competing with his level of tennis because he was a former college tennis player. I beat him 6-0-6-1. After he got shellacked by me in 45 minutes straight, he said to me, you're making me throw out my textbooks. He said, I just operated on a brain last night, and now you're telling me that the brain's way more plastic than I've ever perceived it to be. And then he started to explain what I was actually doing with my brain. That was the exciting part. He was telling me that I was stimulating the basal ganglia on both hemispheres. He said, if you went into a laboratory today with what you can do with your handwriting and your fluency of your left-handed serve and being able to hit forehands and backhands from both sides, you would prove through the PET scan called positron emission tomography that you were uptaking glucose and you were having the firing of the basal ganglia system, including the substantia nigra pars compacta and substantia nigra pars reticulata, much better than I can do. And that's one of the reasons I am, quote, spastic with my opposite hand. So he started making me think, what am I really doing to my brain? Now, this was back in 2001, and now, 15 years later, I've made unbelievable strides in my own personal journey where I have hand-eye coordination that people have never witnessed before. Robert, it's kind of hard to believe, but I can actually bounce a golf ball on the round side of a ball-ping hammer with either hand. My record left-handed is 99 times. My record right-handed is 394 times. I know it's difficult for people to conceive of this type of hand-eye coordination and intuition, but I have students that I teach that are breaking 100 when initially they told me that I was born this way. And I said to them, quite to the contrary, 
I rewired my brain. My position is that of an applied neuroscientist. I don't have an official degree in neuroscience. However, I have an insatiable appetite to know about the mechanics of the mammalian brain. When you read my book, Whole Brain Power, it takes you multiple reads to understand the theory as to what can happen when we become poor stewards of our brain. We're very fortunate to have a man named Len Fox with us today. And Len is going to give us his own story about his understanding of the whole brain power system and how he personally has benefited from the whole brain power coaching. So, Robert, would it be possible for us to patch in Len at this moment? It is, but first let me remind everybody, this is Robert Rogers. I'm the host of the Parkinson's Recovery Radio Show. My guest today is Michael J. Lavery, who is the author of Whole Brain Power. So let me then now introduce our second surprise guest, who is Lynn Fox. Lynn, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Am I on? You are on, and and perhaps you too could tell the audience just a little bit about yourself. My name's Lynn Fox. I'm 61 years old. I live in a town called Savage, Minnesota, which is just south of the Twin Cities. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's about two years ago. So I think I'm a, I'm what they call a my doctor refers to as a stage two level. Um, let me tell you. Let me tell you my story about Michael. I probably met Michael. 12, 15 years ago, um, I came across him at Laguna Beach, where he lives, and he was out on a side street uh, near Las Brisas, a pretty popular restaurant in that area, painting, and I purchased one of his paintings that I'm looking at right now in my house, and uh, and. You should know this about Michael. He's a very gifted artist. That if you have any interest in getting a uh, scenic picture of a California coast, look him up on the Internet because he does some really beautiful uh, artistic paintings. So I bought this painting from Michael, and uh, when I met him, he said, why don't you guys meet me tomorrow morning at Las Brisas, my wife and I, Cheryl, and we'll do the transaction before the sidewalks get busy and and uh, it's nice and quiet. So the next morning, about 7.30, we meet Michael at Las Brisas, and we're sitting out on the patio. And he begins to tell us a story about himself because he wanted us to know about the artist rather than just have a painting that, of, of a beautiful painting of the coast. That we, we would look at the signature and and relate Michael to it. And I tell this story to people because of what Michael did when we met him that day. He took out a piece of paper and sets it down on the on the uh, table and begins to write in it while he's discussing with us and telling us his life story of how he became an artist. And by the time we were done, about 20 minutes later, I'm watching Michael as he's writing this whatever he's doing on this paper, and he's down at the bottom of the sheet of the paper to the far right, and he's writing in cursive something, and he's writing it from the right side of the paper to the left, and he's doing cursive writing. When he was done, he handed me a piece of paper, and I looked at it and said, and it started out with something like, Dear Lynn and Cheryl, thank you for taking the time, and it was perfectly written, in perfect penmanship as you would read a normal letter from the top down and he wrote it from the bottom right upward to the top it blew me away I couldn't believe somebody could actually do something like that I mean I can barely drive and listen to the radio anymore let alone uh, have a conversation and do cursive writing in reverse in the bottom of the page up so that was my um 
that was my introduction to Michael Lavery. And I'm glad I met him that day because it stuck with me. Because when I found myself diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, his book, Whole Brain Power, which I had read probably about five or six years ago, came to mind because I realized that's what I was struggling with. So I met with Michael uh, last year when I was out on spring break with my family in Laguna Beach. I told him what had happened with my diagnosis and signed up for some coaching sessions with Michael and bought another copy of the book because I had a previous copy. So I read through the book, did some coaching sessions, and uh, felt like I had finally found um, some skill sets that could help me with my Parkinson's, like like the hammer that Michael does. I I use a version of it where I take a, a rubber sledgehammer, which only weighs a couple pounds. It's a little bigger head than a ball pin hammer or a regular claw hammer. And I bounce a golf ball off that. And I love doing that because it's something I can do in my front yard. Um, it's, I can do it in my living room. When I travel, I can throw a hammer and a golf ball in my bag and take it with me. And it's had some uh, some amazing impact. I mean, because one of the things you struggle with with Parkinson's is doing things that are measurable. Our doctors have ways of measuring, but I have a hard time measuring how I'm how I'm doing. And when I found Michael's book, I found it was a very good solution to that. Because when you bounce a ball and a hammer, you know the difference between 20 times and 30 times. And if you were doing it 30 times last week and you're suddenly doing it only 20 times, you know you got to work harder. You know you're slipping. And I can also measure the difference between each hand. I'm, I'm kind of right. Parkinson's is, is impacting my right side. And it's kind of interesting to watch how my left side is taking over that responsibility. So I can... I can see my left side strengthening by counting the number of hits I'm able to do, my ability to advance it, and I can compare that to any deterioration or any slipping of ability with my right hand. So the first aspect I liked was the measurability of it. And then I had an interesting observation of one of the symptoms I was experiencing was I would be startled. I was easily startled when I first got Parkinson's. I would, uh, when I would go to the gym, I would walk through a sort of a maze going to the locker room. And even though I knew somebody might be walking toward me in the opposite direction, even though I knew it, when that person's image popped up in front of me, I would get startled. And it was something I hadn't experienced before, and I experienced it when I was driving also. When a car came up along my left, sometimes it would startle me, and I would think it was closer to my vehicle than it was. What I found was when I started doing the hammer and got my hits up a bit, that dissipated. Suddenly when I went into the locker room at the gym, that that tendency to be startled went away. There was more of a relaxation that, that occurred, something I didn't necessarily expect in doing the hammer drills. Um... You know, what what Mike teaches is really what I call mental gymnastics, which is a which is kind of a, a different twist in a lot of the stuff that we read about in, in dealing with Parkinson's. Like one of the like one of the things I like that he that he uses is is um, cursive writing. Cursive writing is a exercise, not something to be intimidated by, but something to go at and conquer. And I struggled with my writing. That was one of the symptoms which led me to the doctor because I would get that crunched up writing. And when I saw that on Michael's book, I thought that this would be kind of interesting. So so when I take out a, a notebook and I start writing, Michael's approach is to is to use cursive writing as an exercise and to approach it from not just accomplishing it but, but a source of pride. He challenges you to 
to do beautiful writing, not just cursive writing, not just legible writing, but beautiful writing. And you, and you find yourself slowing down and, and writing with a lot more intention. Uh, and one of the first things I uncovered in doing that was that a lot of the crunched up writing I was experiencing was a result of not moving my hand as I wrote, not, not having my hand flow across the paper because of that Parkinson's hesitation and that control, which I've gotten much better at controlling. The other thing I did was is I went out and bought a really nice pen so that I could support that intention of writing something beautiful versus writing something legible. And I even do cursive writing with my left hand. I'm not, I'm not too up on the mirror yet, but I find left-handed writing is, was surprisingly easier for me than I expected it to be. In fact, one of my sons commented that my left-handed writing was more legible than his right-handed writing. Mm. So, I, so I've had some good experiences uh, with it. And those are just two of the aspects of it. When you read his book, there's a lot of exercises in there that, that really have a, a good impact. And all of them you can measure, which I think is important, because it's good for us to keep, keep track of how we're doing as Parkinson's patients and, and how we're progressing and how we're deteriorating so that we can own it and, and be mindful of it as, as we go through life. As, it seems like everything we do with Parkinson's, once you're diagnosed, it becomes mindful. And that automatic mode that we were in before in life tends to disappear and be taken over by it. So that's what I wanted to share with you today is just give you a feel for, for my experiences and, and tell you that I, that I highly recommend um, getting Michael's book because it's got such a different take to it and it's been helpful to me. And I also highly recommend you take a look at his paintings. They're, they're beautiful and they're worth the time. So that's my story. Lynn, what symptoms have you seen shift since you've been doing these exercises? Uh, my, well, number one, my penmanship has vastly improved. Uh, that, as I, as I said before, that, that startled, that, that being startled by things going on around me has left. And uh, I just feel like I know where I'm at. I'm, I'm, I'm grounded. I have that sense of every day of how I'm doing when I go out there with my hammer. Does that answer your question, Robert? It does, Lynn. And so when you're doing the hammer, when you're doing the hammer exercises, just so listeners can be clear about how that's actually done, you probably do them outside. You put the hammer on the ground, you're standing up, and then you're bouncing a golf ball with just one hand, uh, bouncing the ball on the hammer and then catching the golf ball and then throwing it back down on the hammer and catching the ball. Is that the way that exercise works? No, no I'm holding the hammer in my hand. I'm holding a rubber mallet in my hand, and I'm dropping a ball on top of the mallet, and then I'm moving my hand up and down and bouncing it off of that face of that rubber mallet. Did that make sense? Yes, that's fascinating. It's Lynn. cool. I mean, I, I can do it. I can do it about 30 times on my right and about 40 times on my left. And I can feel myself getting better at it. And it gives me confidence. It, gives, it lets, makes me feel like I'm in control. To, to some degree about what's going on in my brain. Gentlemen, let, let me inter, intervene at the present. Yes. Feel free, Mike. So when Len says confidence, that's the big C word. That's wonderful to hear. You're getting confidence. Are you also getting joy, Len? Are you receiving a joyful experience? Is your mood better because of it? Oh, my mood's definitely better. Just, just that idea that that I don't have to be 
that that startledness that was a big thing for me when the, when I quit being startled I felt like I felt like a 90 year old man where everything in life was scary and that left so that was nice what happens in the brain gentlemen is that by forcing the non-dominant hand, which is your left hand, to do something that's highly coordinated, because anybody that initially attempts to do the hammer drill training with the rubber mallet will be pleasantly surprised. Even people that are very good athletes can be surprised by the difficulty of the hammer drills, but they adjust rather quickly. And, and I'm very proud of what Len's doing with the hammer drill training, but more importantly, the fact that he's more confident and can see the measurable results and knows that he's slipping. So if he slips a little bit, then he has to get back on the horse and he has to say, I'm going to set a new record. And that's what I do with people such as Len. I challenge Len. Len, since you've done 40 with your left hand, can you get me 80 now? And then so I, I put out a challenge to him. I raise the bar for him. He's being coached by me, and I'm not just saying, you're doing great. No, I'm saying, Len, you can do much better. Instead of actually allowing him to go into a pity party because he's been afflicted by this problem, I'm saying, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. That's a famous quote. I think it was by Yogi Berra. So the game is nine innings long. Sometimes it goes into extra innings. We want extra innings here. We want to have more quality, and we're going to give you some simple exercises that change the brain and change your attitude about learning and stimulate the cells that are producing dopamine. You still have cells that produce dopamine. You don't have as many cells producing the dopamine. You still have cells there. So let's make those cells better factories. Demand the brain produce the dopamine. Demand that the basal ganglia operates bilaterally. Make the myelin continue to grow. And grow your memory, too. Also, Len, tell, tell the audience today about the communications game, how you have to be aware of your speech. Just briefly cover that. Yeah, especially with coaching sessions with Michael, you're not allowed to say, uh-huh, right, mm-hmm, that, that kind of, pausing and it makes you when you have a conversation like one of, as you will in a coaching session with Michael it makes you just ground yourself and and be in present time and and take your brain off of automatic and and speak intelligently and articulate and search for words that um, have a little more meaning than the standard one and two syllable words that we use um, it's invigorating it's because it's an eye opener to how we communicate with each other, especially when you just listen to it on the street. So, so my son read the book too. And at times we will, we will look at each other and say on time and on time means that we catch each other and that we're, we're intentionally conscious of the words we're using in our communication that we're speaking in whole sentences and not interrupting each other's communication with simple, uh-huh, yeah, right, kind of things. That's very good of you to explain it in that light. So what actually occurs is that you have to stay in the moment. I call it the 3M state, mindful maximization of the moment. You are to be cool, calm, and contemplative when you combine the two principles of the mindful maximization of the moment and you also use the cool common collected or cool common contemplative state of your speech you then are now achieving the state by which you the captain of your ship are telling the crew where to go so your brain is one trillion in its numbers so you have one trillion cells at your disposal you have the will and you tell it to speak intelligently. At any time, we could be lazy and say, for sure, bro. Okay, man, not a problem. Really? Not a way. Uh-huh. But what we do in this game called the communications game is we respect each other's intelligence. If you will scrutinize Len Fox's vocabulary, he used the word invigorating. That was a five-syllable word. He used the word unintentional. 
you are using more descriptive vocabulary because it is demanded of you. So this is one of the things that makes the brain stay calm. Most people, from my perspective in the coaching of these clients, demonstrate what I call amygdalated speech production. The amygdala is part of the fight-or-flight mechanism of the brain. When Mr. Fox is being coached by me, he is being notified to stay away from amygdalated speech. Instead, use the contemplative speech. Breathe through your nose, swallow your saliva, and speak intelligent sentences. Is that too much of me to ask from you, Len? No, I think it should be expected. I appreciate you playing the game properly. So what happens to each person in this volley back and forth with our most sacred skill, which is our speech? We now are achieving a state of mild euphoria. The sound that anyone hears most often in their life happens to be their own voice. Most people, from my perspective, are experiencing discord. Their auditory cortex, which is where the sound is being processed through the ears, is being stimulated by, from my perspective, mostly laconic behavior. Laconic behavior has got it right. Huh? No problem. Instead of, I understand your position, Len. Please proceed. I'm fascinated by this discovery on your part. That's intelligent language. That makes the recipient calm down. They also know the nature of the game, and that is to mimic the intelligent behavior. This causes the amygdala to calm down. So one can either be reactionary, Len, or contemplative, Len. Len, which person do you want to be today? you want to be the reactionary guy or the contemplative man? I think I'll go with contemplative. That's a wonderful choice. Now, when you stay in that contemplative state because you're the captain of your ship, what you do now is you do not antagonize the brain. Ladies and gentlemen, let me explain what this concept actually entails. So if you have something that antagonizes you, it's not pleasant. So the brain has chemicals that are naturally occurring that antagonize itself. If we have too much amygdala-driven activities, then our axis of stress is sending signals to the cortex called the adrenal cortex. Notice that it's called a cortex. So the adrenal cortex produces the strong steroids called cortisol, glucocorticoids. They enter the bloodstream and they wreak havoc on the brain when their amounts are too great. We have to have a balance. It's called homeostasis. Upon doing further research on the basal ganglia, where I was stimulated by this neurosurgeon back in 2001, I started researching the basal ganglia, dopamine production from the substantia nigra pars compacta and the substantia nigra pars reticulata, and how the brain actually moves out of homeostasis. Upon doing even more research, after having met Muhammad Ali personally, I have a photograph of Muhammad Ali myself, when he was deep in the Parkinson's disease problem, he had a difficult time speaking when I met him. And I watched his movement. And then one can reverse engineer what might have happened to Mr. Ali's brain. He received much trauma to the brain. So we now know that head trauma can cause death of the dopamine-producing neurons. We also know that amphetamines can wreak havoc on these cells because amphetamines are antagonistic to the dopamine-producing cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta. Now, what can we do to stop traumatizing the brain? We might not want to be playing a sport where you have head contact. You might want to stay away from pesticides, paraquat, 
they've done studies on people that have been exposed to pesticides. How many times people have been hit in the head? How many times have been knocked unconscious for more than five minutes? And there's a serious correlation to developing Parkinson's disease. According to my research, Alzheimer's and dementia happen to be the two top problems with neurological diseases. Parkinson's disease is in the third place. There's a major difference between Alzheimer's and dementia. They call it vascular dementia. Oftentimes, it can be both. Sometimes it can be Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's disease. So let's talk about the inspiration about how people can help mitigate the problems that they're experiencing. You are the captain of your ship. Tell your hands to start doing things that they don't normally do. The subtitle for the Whole Brain Power book is called The Fountain of Youth for the Mind and Body. I encourage people that are listening to this program to go on Amazon and read some of the reviews of people that have gone to the doctor where the doctors are scratching their heads after doing a full workup of the blood panel, they're telling these people that are their patients, your blood is much younger than it used to be. Are you on t- some type of growth hormone? Your HDLs have spiked. Your LDLs have dropped. Your triglycerides are now manageable. Your blood sugar levels have dropped. These are all positive signs of doing mental gymnastics. These are drills that anyone can do. When a person is able to bounce a golf ball off a rubber mallet and stop the golf ball on the rubber mallet head, that means that they are in control of their basal ganglia. So even people that have serious tremors, when they hold the hammer, for some reason, the tremor is lessened. A man had uncontrollable shakiness with his left hand, and I put a rubber mallet in his hand, and his hand started to stabilize. So interestingly enough, when a person is under severe stress and they have to react to a dangerous situation, oftentimes they move normally, and then they go back to their Parkinson's condition. And from my research, oftentimes Parkinson's disease afflicts one part of the body first and oftentimes can spread to the other side of the brain. So most people don't even understand the antagonistic brain chemistry that causes the dopamine system to falter. We know absolutely beyond a shadow of doubt that cocaine abusers can succumb to Parkinson's disease. And we also realize that we have our own digital heroin and digital cocaine that we're experiencing called the modern box called television, Netflix movies, things that cause the the brain to get out of homeostasis, horror movies, things that are unpleasant. A person can be watching a horrible scene on a Netflix show, can go to the theater where their whole brain is put out of homeostasis and their blood pressure is rising and cortisol levels are rising and dopamine production is being antagonized. What happens now is when the brain produces its morphine chemical, ladies and gentlemen, write down this term if you have a piece of paper in front of you and a pencil or a pen. The word is beta endorphine. Beta endorphins are some of the most powerful chemicals known to man. According to science, they're 48 more times more powerful than morphine. Your brain produces beta endorphins for pleasurable experiences such as eating chocolate, having sexual relationships, being completely enthralled by jumping out of a plane. So when people get their beta endorphin fix, they can get it through alcohol, they can get it through cocaine, they can get it through barbiturates, they can get it from benzodiazepines, from Valium, from all the pharmaceuticals that are at our availability. But what happens to the brain is that these dopamine systems start getting impacted. And when you fool the brain and you keep the dopamine in solution longer by causing a failure of the dopamine transporter systems, 
essentially what you're doing is you're faking the brain out, telling it it doesn't have to reuptake its dopamine so we can keep the dopamine in solution. We can keep it in the synaptic cleft longer so we can have the extended euphoria. And we pay a serious price when that happens because what happens is those transporter systems actually start to go away. And now the brain is starting to go through a problem where it's getting antagonized. And what happens is when the brain uses its own natural morphine system, these beta endorphins, they dock on these receptors called mu receptors, morphine uptake receptors, causing the brain to go through bliss. Now, there's a recent article that came out in the New York Post, and it was called Digital Cocaine. One can go on a search engine and research digital cocaine, digital dementia. These are all problems that modern people are having. Doctors now have the brain scanning equipment to show that the person that's addicted to their iPhone playing all of these games are causing brain problems that mimic what a cocaine and heroin user are also experiencing. This is bad for the dopamine production. So the brain has four major workhorses. Those four major trans, transmitter systems, the neurotransmitters specifically, are the acetylcholine system, the dopamine system, the glutamate system, and the GABA system. Now, from my own research and from looking at scientific papers, what happens is we have a system of helper cells. And many people that are experiencing problems with Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or dementia don't even know about the helper cells and the, the responsibility of helper cells to maintain the extracellular matrix, meaning the fluid that the neurons actually reside in. These cells are called glial cells. So you have a cell called the astrocyte. The astrocyte is extremely important for the maintenance of the health of the neurons. Most people don't understand that the astrocyte is what actually spoon feeds the neurons. For the astrocytes are responsible for feeding the neurons a type of fuel called lactate. If your neurons are being deprived of proper glucose through the lactate system, because the astrocytes actually are able to hold on to the capillary systems and pull the glucose from the capillary systems, synthesize it into the food that the neurons eat. If those systems called the astrocytes are malfunctioning, then we're in trouble. So oftentimes what happens in the case of the death of the cells in the substantia nigra pars compacta, in the substantia nigra pars reticulata, what we have is calcium influxes into the cell. So when we have the amount of calcium building up inside cells, we have what they call apoptosis, meaning cell death. And the homeostasis formula is out of balance. And the interesting fact is that many of the dopamine-producing neurons must die before you have the first stages of Parkinson's disease, meaning that the brain has been in a position where it's be being assaulted and antagonized for lengthy periods. So in some cases, up to 80% of the dopamine-producing cells can be dying off before the systems occur, meaning the brain's extremely plastic, and that's the good news for us. If the brain's extremely plastic, let's do things that pull the brain back into homeostasis to the best of our ability. So what we're going to do is start becoming proactive and researching what causes the brain to stay calm, cool, and contemplative. If, if people are in a permanent state of anxiety, it's not a good place for the brain to be. So if a person's always agitated and impatient, that means that they're not in control of their impulses. And one of the best ways to help 
control your impulses is to get a pen and paper and start writing in a journal. And a person will argue, my handwriting is horrible. Your handwriting can improve. So your handwriting might be horrible, but eventually it might be fair. And eventually it might be moderate. Eventually it might be good. Eventually it could be excellent. So this is what we do. We inspire people to improve the hands because the hands physically can maintain the integrity of the myelin in the brain. There are many books in the market talking about myelination of the central nervous system. We now know that the brain has its own stem cells. The hippocampi has the potential to produce neural stem cells. This is called neurogenesis. It's also part of steroidogenesis where the brain actually can elevate its own endogenously produced hormones. When we become a better captain of our ship and we tell the brain that we're not going to just succumb to its decline, we then can help mitigate some of the problems that are being experienced in short-term memory. So we start to practice simple drills such as A is one, B is two. Ask anyone. What's the 18th letter of the alphabet? Robert, can you tell me the 18th letter of the alphabet? I have not thought about that, Michael. I would guess so, uh, V, but I don't know. No, V would be 22. So one of the drills that I suggest people doing is take a breath and go A is 1, B is 2. And then when you're saying C is 3, think of a, an image that reminds you C3PO. And D is 4. I was in 4D. My dog has four legs. Are you understanding what we're doing here, Robert? Yes, I do understand. So what we're doing now is we're going to create new memory formation. So these memories aren't just going to go away tomorrow. So if R is 18, that's the year you registered. Now, your name using numbers would be as follows, 18, 15, 2, 5, 18, 20. Do you think that my brain is processing information rather quickly along the myelinated white matter tracks, Robert? I would say yes. Most people think that these drills are insignificant, but they have tremendous impact on the brain. Most people cannot do the alphabet backwards, yet almost everyone can count backwards from 10. Can, can you count backwards from 10? Of course you can. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Now do the alphabet back from the 10th letter, J, I, H, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And this is one of the training methodologies that I teach people that are CEOs of major corporations. And <laughs> Sometimes they laugh and, and they go, I'm learning how to do my alphabet backwards and I'm 60. But they can't remember they were supposed to call you yesterday or where did I put my keys? What's your name again? This is a serious problem. The United States of America has an epidemic of Parkinson's disease. It also has an epidemic of Alzheimer's and dementia and problems with mood. Many people are severely depressed, anxiety-prone. Teenagers have a serious problem with anxiety, and we're just throwing the silver bullets at the problem. We're giving the brain substitutions, pharmaceutical pills, in order to really address a more serious problem. We need to solve the problem holistically. And that's what I teach in the whole brain power system. Most people today can't recite their states in alphabetical order. People practice that. Is that one of the drills I asked you to do, Len Fox? I'm still working in the alphabet, Mike. <laughs> well, at least you're working on it. And and working as a matter of fact, I, I use it sometimes when I'm going to sleep. Rather than count sheep, I'm doing A1, B2, C3, D4. That's awesome. I'm so happy that you're doing that. And it actually helps put you to sleep. And I believe we spoke recently that your sleep has improved as part of the training. Is that true? It has. Sleeping is not a problem for me. That's wonderful. And many people that are having problems with Parkinson's disease are having problems with sleep. And sleep is where the brain rejuvenates itself and repairs itself and helps clear 
the extracellular matrix. That's what the glial cells are actually doing in their cleanup job. The microglial clean up dead neurotransmitters, excuse me, dead neurons, and then clean up neurotransmitter debris, and also maintain the calcium concentrations in extracellular matrix. And the illegal dendrocytes are responsible to myelinate existing white matter tract systems that are being used properly. That's called long-term potentiation. The opposite is called long-term depression. So our brain has the capacity to continue to expand its neural fields. One of the recommendations that I make to anyone is to start learning about your brain. I can ask extremely intelligent people simple questions about the brain, and they have no idea. They only know these problems exist when they have Parkinson's disease or they're having memory loss, and the doctor will say, well, you have an atrophication of the head of your hippocampus. That's called Amen's horn. It's significantly reduced in size. Or you have missing tissue here on the, in the frontal lobes of the brain. You, you have more cerebral fluid in your brain than is supposed to be there because you've lost some neural fields. That's not a good place to be. But at least we have the information at our availability so we can start becoming more proactive. You're listening to the Parkinson's Recovery Radio Show. This is your host, Robert Rogers. My guests are Michael Lavery and Lynn Fox. Michael, we have just a few minutes left. Where can people obtain your book, Whole Brain Power? Well, there's a, the book, Whole Brain Power, The Fountain of Youth for the Mind and Body. There's also the workbook called the Whole Brain Power Workbook and Progress Journal. You can get those books on Amazon, so just do a Google search, or you can go on to, to another site called Whole Brain Power Coaching, and we have a downloadable program, which costs $67. If anybody's into golf, we have a program called Whole Brain Golfer, and we all have another program called Whole Brain Guitar for guitar players. And since I'm into all these different endeavors in my life as the Renaissance man, I have all of these different systems that people can purchase to help their own particular journey. And if anybody is interested in doing go ahead. That website, once again, is Whole Brain Power Coaching dot N E T. That's correct. You, you can just you do also, a Google search and just go ahead. Michael, Michael, you also do coaching. Tell people how they can sign up for coaching if they'd like to be able to connect with you personally. Well, if you want to reach me at wholebrainmichael at gmail.com, you can send me an email and inquire about my coaching services. Some people do coaching with me for a one-year period. Other people elect to do 30, 60, 90-day coaching. And the coaching is extremely effective. So once again, my email is whole, W-H-O-L-E, brain, B-R-A-I-N, Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at gmail.com. And I'll get back to you when you email me. Michael, I'm going to spell that once more for people a little bit more slowly. W-H-O-L-E-B. R-A-I-N-M-I-C-H-A-E-L at gmail, G-M-A-I-L dot C-O-M. Well, Michael, I want to thank both you and Lynn for taking the time to be on the show today. I must say this has been the most engaging and exciting radio show that I've aired in a number of years. Well, I appreciate you saying so. And, Lynn, thank you for taking the time to tell your story and to be on the show today as well. You're welcome, Robert. We appreciate your participation, Lynn. And hopefully you've inspired people to become more proactive with their Parkinson's disease problems and to enlighten them to help mitigate some of these 
difficulties? To be sure, Michael, Lavery has some of the most impressive and exciting ideas I've seen in a long time, and it means that individuals who currently experience Parkinson's can actually take control over their own recovery. There are activities that they can do every day that will make a huge difference in their ability to see a sustained relief from whatever symptoms they currently experience. And that's what's happening on, you guessed it, the shores of the Puget Sound, where all the women are smart, all the men are handsome, and all the children are truly loved. Know that by virtue of the fact that you are listening to this radio program today, that you indeed are on the road to recovery. I'm your host, Robert Rogers. Connect into Parkinson's Recovery for the many services that we offer that are helping more and more individuals find sustained relief from the symptoms of Parkinson's that they currently experience. May your coming week prove to be absolutely, totally magnificent. Good day. <laughs> 